Good afternoon, traders, and welcome to the one, the only stock market movers with, of course, I'm your host, Money Mitch. Welcome to the show that covers all the headlines and gets to the experts to keep you guys in the informational edge. That's really what it's all about here. Today, we got a great show for you. We're going to cover dead cat bounce, market rallying. We also got, of course, some financial engineering going on out there. We'll talk a little bit about that. Some crypto action over the weekend. We also going to get into it with our guests coming on up at 115 we we'll talk a little bit about some inflation of course with our following guests at the 145 slot we always have two experts on that's what it's all about here on money mitch guest for today at 115 we're going to be getting it with jane galena the airplane jane if you guys don't know her she's a day trader active on the markets we'll talk a little bit about also some crypto action on out there and then at 145 we got luke lloyd wealth advisor investment strategist at strategies wealth partners we'll talk about him he's usually on fox business now he's on right here on benzinga so do me the favor Hit the thumbs on up. Who's ready to start the day? Get into the headlines and, of course, get into the informational edge that you guys need to continue on killing it out there. Let's go ahead. Let's dive on in and welcome to Money Mitch. And I know, I know, I know my intro says that the bull market's here to stay. Hopefully we get it back, right? It's time for Money Making Mitch. When investors need a story, we're going to the moon. Welcome to Money Mitch, where story is everything. I'm here to find you the next opportunity. It's all about the green hands. Now we all know the bull market is here to stay. Money Mitch. All right, traders, let's first let's start diving on in and seeing what we're seeing out in the market. It's been a battle um, and uh, stocks are bouncing back a little bit here. Let's take a look at the SPY and see how we're trading on a 15 minute basis here. I'll put the 15 minute chart up for us. Uh, let me throw myself at the bottom here and we're getting a little bit of a bounce back, right? Stacks, uh, stocks bouncing back after a real beating uh, last week, over 5% on the downside. The comeback was a broad one here with 482 members of the S&P 500 going into the green. We like to focus on market breadth here. I think that's one thing that I really focus on. I think it's something that I think I could teach you guys to really focus on. One of the things that I like to focus on is, of course, the SMA 200. If we take a look here, the SMA 200, where is it on the SPY? That's all the way up here. You see this purple line up here. That's where the SPY is. That's where my SMA 200 is there. There's a big reason why we use the SMA 200. So one of the things that you can do is you can take a look at market breadth by, of course, the SMA 200. And one of the things I like to do is see if it's above or below. And this is a, just a starting point on if a stock is in a bullish mode or in a bearish mode. And I think this is very important because we want to know how to determine long-term trends and when the long-term trends are changing. So one of the areas I watch is what's above SMA 200, what's below. This got down towards 11% this morning, got all the way up to around 14% on the upside. Now we're just at 138 So I've really been looking for that moment where we can tick down below 10%. Reason why is I'm looking for that final capitulation, right? Everyone's talking about that word. When does the capitulation actually happen? When do the, when do the bulls just finally give up? And even the bears are like, man, this, this looks... This looks tough out there, uh, but definitely um, I also like to compare that to the SMA 50 and you guys can watch that right now. We're at 16.3. We've come up from a 13% base this morning. I want to see if this can go below 10. One thing I'm also looking for is the SMA 50 to start kind of turning around. That will show us the turn first and then the SMA 200 will show us the turn Right now, it is showing a little bit high. If we look at the advancing uh, and right now in decliners, it's about 77.6% of stocks up and about 18.7% uh, stocks coming down right now. New highs is still only at 12.7%. So that shows me that I shouldn't be freaking out. I'm not late to the move. Even if you think this is the bottom, doesn't mean you're late. 
This is kind of early innings if this is the bottom. Of course, that's up to you to determine if it is. Right now, I'm looking at this as being a dead cat rally. Yes, I said it, guys. Dead cat rally. So a lot of people have the question out there. Is this a dead cat rally or is this just a bull trap? I'll explain why I think it's a dead cat rally. And I think that's also important, right? The whys, right? And so if we go here on the daily, one thing that I've been looking at is, and I use RSI to kind of picture this, is moments of extreme, right? And so when it's up here, it's a good sign that's showing you overbought moments where it's really kind of pushing and you could see a turnaround. And then also on the bottom side, oversold. When do we get to this point that we're really hitting the RSI on the downside and we could see reversals? Doesn't mean that I'm calling an ultimate bottom, but could we have a rally back? Yes, technically it was setting up this morning. And you can see as we bounce back on Friday, we got to a low there of the RSI of 2143. I literally had this area drawn out at 2396. I wanted to see a, a click underneath that. And then I could see us rallying a little bit. And of course, I'm still looking towards the overall downside, but that doesn't mean as a day trader, like we do on live trading, that we're not going to be able to capture the intraday momentum and make some gains. So here's a clear example, the SPY bouncing off of that level, getting back up there towards the 373, 375 area. Where could I see us holding up? Uh, I don't see us passing around the 380s. That would definitely get me a little bullish if it got past that level. Reason why is there's some daily resistance right up here around the 380s. And you can see that's where we kind of held here, 379.20s. There's a close right up here. Then I would like a look after that, if we get a little bit higher than that, then we could see some continuation. Of course, some people would be looking for some kind of pushback into the 410s up there, maybe towards the 417. Right now, 380s in reach. We'll see what happens. 15-minute candle has this kind of in the, kind of a little uh, rounding pattern here. We'll see if we can get out of this. If you look at the one hour, you've just been doing sideways here. We'll see if this are able to hold the gains. Is this a bull trap or dead cat rally? Honestly, it might be both, right? It could be a dead cat rally going into a bull trap. So just be careful on out there, guys. Like always, make your own investment decisions, your own analysis of risk. But this is what I see right now in the market. All right, normally we do what's hot and what's not, but I want to go into uh, some headlines, make sure we get after them. So let's go ahead. Let's dive into some of these headlines. First, we're going to talk about my trade of the day. I was watching this stock, talked about it in pre-market um, right before the bell on live trading was XOM. reason I was looking at this one is that it's been beaten down the last couple of days, right? So I'm looking for a little bit of a bounce going into the open, and that's exactly what we got out the open. It was a good VWAP bounce trade. If you guys don't know that trade, definitely make your way on over to live trading and we'll teach you that. Um, that's literally what we look for in that strategy is a push on up, a pullback to VWAP holding, and then really holding above VWAP. You can tell here the stock actually broke out, got above VWAP, came back to kind of uh, the 50 moving average, but not even coming back here towards the VWAP until just recently. And what does it do? It holds that breakdown and gets right back up above it now at 92 and looking to continue. You can take a look at this on the 15 minute as you see this kind of ramp on up. Where do I see some resistance? Up there towards the 94 is where I can see it starting to push towards. We'll see if this can continue getting. And we'll also talk about this with our guests. But why could this have happened? Well, Exxon Mobil was getting a lift because Credit Suisse uh, upgraded them to an outperform from neutral and said that they can jump another 45% from these levels. Keep these on your radar. We're watching the oil and seeing the energy can continue going. Of course, watch stocks like Chevron. Um, I'll, I'll get you closer towards the action right now. You can see Chevron holding the gains too. MRO holding the gains. And of course, if you want something leveraged for a day trade, you could always take a look at Gush. Gush is setting up there for a nice little drive. We'll see if this can continue. And of course, Exxon Mobil getting the lift here on a rating. All right, let's go ahead. Let's continue going here. Let's go towards Fang. Fang is diamond back here. And um, right here, let's take a look here at Fang. Having a great day, bouncing up there towards 132, Diamondback Energy. And this is coming after the board approval on an increase to its capital return program uh, that at least at least 
of free cash flow from its previous commitment of at least 50% free cash flow. And what have people and investors been talking about during this time is look for what cash flow cash flow is what we're looking for. We'll continue to see that. Let me go ahead and make sure that our guest has the link here. That would be a good one, Mitch. Just trying to make sure here. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, there you go. All right. Um, no, nah, there you go. I make sure she got it there. She should be joining us in just a few minutes. Shouldn't go bad. I, I always love having Airplane Jane because she's deep inside the works that we see on the daily. And we'll also touch a little bit of a topic that I think retail traders on out there will love. AMC, GM, GME fans, stay tuned. I have a feeling you guys will like one of the questions that I give Jane Galena coming on up. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's get to, of course, uh, we can get into Kellogg's, of course. Uh, but I'm actually going to hold Kellogg's. I'm going to hold Kellogg's there. We'll talk a little bit about that because my frosted flakes need to stay frosted. And in this inflationary environment, I'm starting to get worried that I'm going to have to go to the knockoff brand because I don't know about you guys. But uh, this market isn't snack, crackle, pop out there with the Rice Krispie game. Uh, but let's go ahead. Let's transition away from right now the overall market. One of the things that we have been seeing, of course, is over the weekend, Bitcoin breaking down a little bit further, going even into the 1700, 17,000 handles there. You guys, we're, we're going to continue to see this kind of up and down flow. But I wanted to bring on a trader, someone that kind of stays up in the cryptocurrency market, some somebody that actually does this on the daily. And I want you guys to go ahead and get the expert opinion. So let's go ahead. Let's bring on my guests here. We're going to go to Jane Galena here. Or I should I say, clear the runway, guys. Clear the runway because Jane Galena, Airplane Jane, about to join us. Let's go ahead and bring her on. All right. How you doing? Hold on one second. I can't hear anything, so I'm putting it on my speakers. So two seconds. <laughs> Hold Setting on. bar below. Setting bar below. Okay. Got it. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello. So I haven't heard Perfect. anything that you were saying. I saw your mouth moving, but I couldn't hear anything. And so thank That's you. All about. No worries. All I said was clear the runway. Clear the awesome. runway. I should have gave you that one. Hey, awesome. all right. And we're not so live yet. So good. See, this is why I wanted to test it all out. <laughs> perfect. You're going great. Let's go ahead. Um, so what do you see on out there right now in the crypto market? I know it's been tough. I know you kind of keep up with it right now, but what are you seeing right now in the markets? Well, you know what, Mitch? I have been following this intensely. I'd say, goodness, for the past 18 months. Um, calling the breakout on Bitcoin over, you know, 16 months ago and really starting to see a putting the dark pool prints together with the crypto space, but also understanding what's going on with the banking world, the financial world, the global market. Where are we going with this global message messaging system that's going to eliminate the swift what cryptos are involved in this? and seeing how that could play into the Bitcoin and Ethereum crash, in my opinion, down to zero, unless they sort of rewrite the Ethereum script to be very similar to XRP and XLM. Um, really, I personally will think, believe that we are going to see Bitcoin and Ethereum go to the graveyard. Oh, so that means uh, you're probably with some of the people out there that are calling it another crypto winter. Is this a crypto winter? Yeah, well, we do see that Bitcoin does tend to lead the crypto space overall. And much like the S&P 500, uh, Apple will tend to lead the S&P 500 and the Qs. So seeing that as well with Bitcoin and Ethereum, those are the first two names that you think of in your head when you think of crypto. However, XRP and uh, XLM were right there developed at the same time as well. And what we have to remember is that Somewhat with this XRP lawsuit that we're seeing is that it is going to set a standard for the crypto space overall. But the biggest point of contention is Ethereum and Bitcoin getting preferential treatment from the SEC. And is that really valid? Um, and yes, I think that we are definitely in a winter. Some 90% of crypto, I believe, is going to actually completely disappear. 
Wow, that's uh, definitely a warning signs on out there. Um, and one of the warning signs that we have seen is lately with the platforms, right? Um, Celsius, uh, the recent one that's going through some issues, but there's concerns. And I was wondering, do you have any liquidity concerns with these platforms? Have you seen any issues? Are you yourself just keeping keeping it in? What do you think about the platforms right now? Well, I do check the crypto market daily. I'm also sharing my screen in our crypto tunities room. Um, however, I am not so much of a day trader of crypto. I'm more of a holdler. And so what I have always done is I will go, I will take my fiat money, convert it into the crypto of my choice, and then I take it off the exchange and put it into a wallet. Because if these exchanges go down, if the internet goes down, however long it is, if they shut their doors, then your crypto assets are locked up with the exchange. And I think this is a bigger warning for people than they actually realize. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of our money is digital. We have digital US dollars. We have credit cards. We have Venmo. We've got PayPal. How many people out there have stacks of cash in their house? Very, very few. And what we're seeing with Celsius, what we're seeing with Coinbase, what we're seeing with Binance, all of these that are saying, hold on a second, we're going to halt the withdrawals. How about the physical banks? People need to recognize the fact that this can happen at the physical banks too. We saw it happen in Turkey. We saw it happen in Lebanon. We saw it happen in Venezuela. It can happen in the US as well. Everyone thinks, oh, we're a superpower, but the banks could shut their doors as well. And if you don't have cash or if you don't have your crypto in a hard wallet or soft wallet, you're sort of up creek right <laughs> that's the truth i mean at the end of the day i mean that's always been one of the things that ha i've seen out there mentioned is, is is going more into the cold and taking it down right from the platforms and i think this is one thing that i think has been advised and you know educated on but there's another thing if consumers are actually following this right i mean at the end of the day um what i've seen is a lot of people putting out worries or saying that they've been robbed either with some uh, scams out there. And I'm seeing the scams continuing. Even I get the messages uh, for the scams on a daily basis. So of course, we got to be careful on out there. But what do you think it's really going to take to really start trying to form a bottom in cryptocurrency overall? Or maybe that could be in NFTs, whichever you want to kind of relate to. But what do you think has to really happen here for us to get kind of a bottoming? I think what's really going to create a bottom, not just in the crypto market, but in the whole global atmosphere, that macro view, is the fact that the U.S. fiat dollar is based on hot air by the Fed. We've seen that the Russian ruble went gold backed. Switzerland just started buying gold from Russia now. We are seeing that we are starting to get gold backed currencies around the world. And once we went off of the gold back system in 1971 with Nixon, our dollar became a debt instrument. And so right now it's a matter of almost resetting the world economy away from the US dollar. Hey, I am a born raised American. However, I think that our US dollar is worth a whole lot of hot air. And right now we're going to see this completely erode the Evergrande debacle. We're gonna see the markets implode. We're gonna see foreign currencies implode. There's 14 that are pegged to the US currency. And I think we're going to see the entire crypto Forex stock market all drop. And that's what's going to create a bottom. Um, right now, it's very, very young in the bearish market, in my opinion, for stocks and for crypto. So I think we have a ways to go. We do have some nice rallies, though. We do have some Stocks moving to the upside today. I was looking at Finviz. We have 77% uh, that are moving to the upside today. So great short pops, short squeezes. However, I do not believe that those can be sustained because the dark pools have had the big prints at the top. Perfect. That adds into my last question, but you did hint to something there that I want to go ahead and touch a little bit. And so where can investors look for safety in here? Do you see anything that looks like a safety trade to kind of play? Right now, in my opinion, cash and physical metals, right? Having some cash at home for that, oh my goodness, what if scenario, maybe those banks do shut their doors and you have cash for two weeks. Um, and also having physical assets because gold, metals, silver, palladium, platinum, copper, these items tend to retain value no matter what is going on in the market. 
and they are a way to barter, right? If you had to, you could take old silver uh, dimes or you could take copper pennies, yeah. you could take silver quarters, you could go and you could use these as a form of payment, but they're also a metal as well. So holding on to some physical assets right now, if you're not a short seller, you might want to hang out in a cash position because the market is likely going to be moving to the downside, except for when you get those signals for the awesome short squeeze pops. Yeah, something to keep on watch. I mean, I I, I come from Venezuela where they're, they're using literally gold right now um, as currency. So, uh, I mean, I know how that is. Uh, last question I have is more about the retail traders on out there. Um, I know they don't hear too much about this. You hear sometimes mentions but that's really goes under wraps. And I know that you kind of keep up on it. And that's the last question, of course, the dark pool action. How does this affect markets? And why should retail traders be informed about the dark pools? Great question, Mitch. Well, you know, the dark pools are really the ones that run the market. This is the really, really big money of the market. So we have that big, massive whale that has, say, a million shares of Amazon that they want to trade or even... 5 million shares of Apple that they want to trade. And it gets picked away at by the little retail traders. Uh, in fact, I saw somewhere that BlackRock holds 40% of all stocks. So when you think about it, these dark pool trades are the really big, massive hedge fund investors, massive houses that have a lot of money. And when they place a trade, it tends to be pretty cut and dry. Hey, if we go above this, they were buying. If we go below it, they were selling. And one of the amazing things is I also teach about this over at the trading pit at the darkpools.com, but we also have a free room where people can come in, they can check it out. They can sort of, you know, tiptoe in, see what's going on and get a taste of what we do in our education program every Tuesday. I'm going to be talking next Tuesday about sort of getting rid of that ego in trading because that can be one of the biggest hurdles for all traders. Definitely something to go ahead and check on out. I do want to tell everybody, go ahead and check out Jane's website, cjanetrade.com. I also looked in the description for you, so you can just click on it. And then you can also find her Twitter. Go ahead and add her. Uh, definitely, let's give her a follow. I hope that you guys appreciated me bringing on Jane here. Um, in the everyday works, just like I am, you know, and that's what I really want to do is bring on those experts, people that have the view, the same kind of view that I'm doing is watching the markets every single day. So thank you, Jane, for coming on. And I hope that uh, you get to plenty, uh, hit that follow button right there, guys. Let's go ahead and give Airplane Jane some follow. Jane Galena here, guys. This is a day trader, published artist, Yogi. And don't forget it, guys, that fit mom. You got to gotta, gotta shout out to the, all the moms out there, and especially continuing to work on a daily basis. So thank you for joining me, Jane. And I'll definitely have you back. Thank you, Mitch. Have an amazing day. Carpet Profit, guys, sees those profits one trade at a time. Definitely. We'll see those profits. All right, let's go ahead. Let's continue on going. That's what the show's all about here on Stock Market Movers with Money Mitch. Of course, getting to the information, trying to keep us in the edge because we all need some edge out there. So let's go ahead. Let's continue going on some headlines on out there. I wanted to touch Kellogg's before I brought on Jane. So let's go ahead. Let's touch a little bit about what happened here. The cereal company is gaining about 4%, and it looked like it kind of gave up a lot of those gains here at the open. Uh, you guys can see here how we came on back here towards the 6934s, uh, but this is after plan. Uh, they announced Plan Tuesday to split into three separate public companies. And so what they're doing here is they will be centered around snacking, cereal and plant-based business so all these getting separated trying to do some financial engineering here to try to get to the best area uh, it does look like i'm losing a little bit of internet there a little bit let me know guys if i do start cutting out a little bit just just a slight tick there of my, my internet but there you go we're, we're back on up let's keep it going uh links please let's look in the description below like click the see more button and you'll be able to just click on there and give her a follow. All right, so Kellogg's is one that I'll keep on watch as they keep trying to engineer things here. Um, they weren't the only ones going into kind of changing things up. MBLZ, um, I'll talk about Mondelez. They did buy Cliff, Cliff Bar. If you guys know the breakfast, um, that was a big purchase. I think this is just showing you guys that some companies are taking some 
measures here to try to swing for some kind of future growth. And I think that they're not the only ones. We're going to continue to see some companies that don't have some money on the balance sheets or are willing to take on something here. You're going to start seeing them take on some shots. That's why we also saw Fang um, trying to do that board approval. You're going to see some other companies taking some shots out here. So keep this on your radar because there are some companies that are seeing themselves in a good opportune time to grab some maybe MMA or re reconstruct their, their strategy, how they're going to go about it in the next couple of years. And we're seeing some mentions here of some bigger names. Let's go ahead. Let's get on over to Google. Um, so you guys can look at Let's look at class A here, um, Google. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's talk a little bit about what we saw here. So there's a report out right now. Um, it's from here. It's from Ad Age. And the report is that the search giant is in talk with Netflix here about a potential advertising partnership. Uh, this is very important. Google has emerged as the front runner to partner with Netflix. As you guys know, Netflix is trying to find ways to what? Continue the growth. Continue uh, kind of innovating here, trying to find ways. And we're going to see companies try to do this. So maybe they come back here with like kind of cheaper, uh, cheaper price point to get some people, more people in here as subscribers yet. They might, you know, do a whole bunch of ads with a partnership like Amazon. This is all opening the doors to new ways to get some growth back into these names. I think this is something that you keep on watch and you look for other companies to repeat suit. This is what we're seeing in the markets right now. And I think you're going to continue to see uh, kind of stocks do this. So let's go on over to our next topic. We're going to keep it going here. We don't slow down here on, mar on stock market movers. That's really what it's all about here is continuing to get through all the headlines that you guys need to get your informational needs. So do me the favor, guys. Smash up the likes. Uh, and I did see that question there of why Pfizer is booming. I got you. Stick around. We'll take a look at Pfizer in a second here, and we'll take some stocks from the chat. Let's keep going. Let's try to get through all the headlines, and then I'll go ahead and try to cover any stocks that you guys need to or have a question on. So let's go ahead. Let's get into save here. That's the next step. And so what's going on here? Well, we're still in the battle here. We all know that Frontier Airlines uh, kind of stepped up first and was trying to grab spirit, but JetBlue here boosting its takeover offer for the company by $2 per share to $33.50. So what does this mean? So there you guys see, they're trying to lean over spirit to getting on over, figuring a way to get to JetBlue because right now they're kind of in the works here with Frontier and the company said it expects to decide on its proposal by June 30th. So we're nine days away here, something to definitely keep on watch. You could see that lift today coming to 24. Right now it's hanging out there at the 23 mark. We'll see what happens with these. Uh, of course, let's take a look also at JetBlue giving up some of the gains right now. And ULCC, which is Frontier, as it's uh, – we'll see if this can kind of keep on up. We'll, we'll see what happens here. I think it's a story to definitely keep on watch. As two discount airlines right here battling here, one of them trying to buy the other, the other JetBlue coming on in here trying to take one of these low carriers. I think it's important to kind of keep multiple cheap airlines, but we'll see what happens. Let's keep moving with the news and let's go ahead. Let's bring you some more news here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some earnings. Let's talk about Lennar here. Okay, so L-E-N here, Lennar. Uh, it's trying to hold some of these pre-market gains here. I'll show you guys that right now. We can take a look here. You can see how you've gone sideways here. If you take a look at the hourly, this is going to make it a little bit cleaner. So then we can go ahead and draw this trend line right now that it is trying to hold. We'll see if it can get on up there towards 67 today. Uh, but what were those earnings today? It was a beat and a beat. Let's talk about that. It was an adjusted EBITDA of $4.69, beating the $3.98 estimate there. So a really good beat there. Um, we're talking more than a 70 cent beat there on the EPS. Now, if you look at the sales, they were at 8.36 billion, beating an 8.11 billion estimate. So definitely still a beat there. There. One of the areas, though, that you started seeing concerns were, were the comments from the CEO. 
um, he stated here, while our second quarter results demonstrates strength and excellence performance throughout the quarter, the weight of a rapid doubling of the interest rates over six months together with accelerated price appreciation began to drive buyers in many markets to pause and reconsider. We begin to see these effects after the quarter end. The Fed statement determination to curtail inflation through interest rates. So the Fed's determination to destroy inflation and how they're going about it. They're going about it through the interest rate increase. That quanti- uh, The quantitative tightening has begun to have the desired effects on slowing the sales in some markets and stalling price increases across the country so there you guys have it showing you a little bit of worry in those comments but also showing you these numbers i would say they're they're kicking some butt here so uh, keep your eyes on lenard we'll see if that can get back on through that high and start making a good gain there next stock let's go ahead let's keep it going here let's go towards a crowd favorite um this is palantir Palantir getting a little bit of a lift today. Um, Where did this come from? Bank of America initiated coverage of the defense tech system with a buy rating here. The firm said investors are underestimating the demand for artificial intelligence that should boost Palantir's stock. And so you guys are seeing a nice lift here right now, trying to get back above nine. You can draw a trend line there and looking for a move back above that. We'll see if this gets into 925. And really starts pushing. I've drawn this kind of sideways action. We filled this gap once. Let's see if we can fill it back again here. So I drew this a while back. I drew this on May 13th. Let's actually extend it out to see if we can get back into that space and get into that resistance. Where did we find resistance last time? We found it at the high there, 942. So I'm going to go ahead and put around 950, the area where I'll start getting excited about Palantir if it's on a real breakout here. All right, time to catch up with the chat. What's going on out there? We still got about 10 minutes to our next interview here. When you confuse uh, Palantir and Peloton, um, <laughs> what happened, Darth? You confused it? It happens, man. No worries. I won't ride on the bike on, Pe- on Palantir Technologies. Uh, but Peloton, who knows? Maybe Peloton comes back. Maybe Nike buys Peloton. Who knows, really? Um, let's keep going. Uh, let's look, let's talk about the next stock here. I want to talk about Charles Schwab. Okay, uh, Charles Schwab stepping in here and getting an upgrade. UBS stepping up to the plate with Charles Schwab at CHW, guys. If you guys don't know the ticker, and let's take a look how it, it's performing today. So a nice little raise there. Got a nice little boost. Trying to hold back against the VWAP. We'll see if this gets another lift. UBS upgrading Charles Schwab to a buy from neutral. And in the note, uh, it stated that Schaub, uh, Schaub was well insulated from the credit and market risk. So that there's no credit and market risk? Well, not really none, but well insulated there. Um, definitely something to keep on watch as you guys see these upgrades and downgrades. We're going to definitely try to note some of these when we get them. And of course, if you guys see an upgrade or a downgrade that's really affecting some of these stocks, you guys can always throw them up in the chat and I'll go ahead and catch them. Looks like we got some good new faces in the chat. If you're new to the show, do me the favor, smash the like. Let's see if we can get to 200 likes today. And if you guys are enjoying the show, that's really what it's about. If you guys aren't enjoying it, let me know. But if you are, smash up that like. All right, let's go ahead. Let's get into now, of course, uh, you guys probably have been seeing a lot of action. Of course, Elon Musk added again here. Um, but there was a, a couple comments that I think we need to kind of keep on watch. Let's take a look at Twitter. Twitter having a good day today. You can see here it's bouncing back, trying to get back and hold the 3850 breakout. It tried to get on up there in the pre market, it couldn't hold it. Now it's just put in a nice bullish engulfing candle. I would look for this bottom to hold 3840s now. Start making a drive back. Let's see if the stock can end up the day around this 3950. I'll put a green box there just in case we get over there at the close. You guys know that we'll be going into at the close, of course, with Joel Conan. That'll be at 3.30, so don't miss that show. Uh, but Twitter making its move back on up, looking to make a move towards third nine. And what have lately we've been getting out of Elon? Let's take a look here. Elon Musk says that there's three issues that need to be resolved before Twitter buyout can go ahead. The first one, we've heard it before. 
the fake accounts. The second one, we've heard it before, the debt financing. And the third one, I think the one that you guys should keep on watch is, of course, the shareholders' approval. I think the shareholders' approval is going to be going through, through the vote. But will something happen? Will the SEC step in here? Will somebody step in here and say, no, we don't want this and don't accept it to happen? Keep on watch. I think there's a lot of worry on out there on both sides. What happens? Is Elon even trying to go through the deal? We'll see what happens there. But definitely a good day there for Twitter as it's trying to get back up through the highs there of 39. If it gets to 39, you'll start seeing at least a little reversal here as we filled in the whole gap and now can come back through 40, trying to come back towards that 55. As you guys can see, I'll delete some of these lines so that we don't get confused on this, but let's keep this on watch. Above 4071 is where I'd start watching to see if it can get back on up into the gap zone. All right, and that's going to be for Twitter here, guys, but definitely let's keep on going here. We got about 137. I did see comments in the chat. Uh, now we can go ahead and I'll take some stocks from you guys out there. I did see mentions of Pfizer earlier. I said I'd talk about it. Let's go ahead. Let's take a look here how we're doing on Pfizer. The only thing that can kind of get me going on Pfizer is what has recently happened, right? And so what has recently happened about the vaccine? Um, and, and that's what I think what's important here is comparing the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines for young children. Um, that, that's what really has been lately being shown up. So that's what I would keep on watch. As you guys can see, investors giving this a little bit of a lift. But don't look only at Pfizer. Look at mRNA, Moderna. And you can see that lift coming in there too. And a lot of this coming off of those headlines. So just pay attention. We'll see if these stocks can come back. They're getting a little bit of a bounce right now. It's not a monster move. Um, I would really want to see it. Let's let's go ahead. Let's take a look here on the monthly uh, so we can see Pfizer sideways here on the monthly. And you guys can see it. If it gets back on through 55, that's really where it's going to get bullish here. There's a support here building up on the monthly around 47.64. So don't really want to see that break down again around 47 if you want to kind of just round it down here. Um, we'll look to see if this can get back on through 55. That's where I would get a little bit interested that, yeah, you're going to get a little bit of a lift. But right now, it is pulling back. We'll see if it can get back up there. All right, I got Pfizer to go through. What else was mentioned in the chat here? I did see some uh, Fubo action. Uh, Fubo is probably getting a little bit of a bounce back after getting really beaten down. This stock is down there to $2.85. A lot of worries out there for Fubo and what's going to continue to happen. Um, another thing that I, I didn't, I don't see too much on is their betting action. They were supposed to kind of open up their own sports betting. They keep trying to kind of make mentions towards it. I want to see continuations of what happened there, but definitely getting a little bit of a lift after a real beatdown name. And you can see it also in like a stock like Roku today, right? Roku getting a nice little lift. Also a stock like Vizio, VZIO. And so all these kind of move hand in hand, but you can tell here, just like Vizio, Fubo has been getting uh, destroyed. Vizio has been getting destroyed. Roku has been getting destroyed, really. It's down to 88 when it was over 400 during the pandemic. That just shows me signs of concern. Where is Roku going to stop? Honestly, we don't know right now, but there is some bottoming action around the 80s. We'll see if that can hold on Roku. Uh, I use Fubo for some sports watching. Yeah, they have really good soccer, really good soccer uh, kind of channels. They have a lot of sports channels. Um, they aren't too expensive. Um, I use more sling sometimes when I'm using streaming TV, uh, but I kind of bounce back and forth. I don't usually stay with a streaming service. And I think that's the same thing that happens with Fubo is that there's not too many people that are just staying. And usually us people that cut the cable, yeah, we can go towards it for a little bit with a streaming service, but we normally come like back and forth. We'll be like, okay, we're going to give up this streaming service. We'll get this one. And so there's kind of that handoff or trade-off on which one you want to keep. So we'll see what happens. For right now, I'm not too focused on this as being a big comeback as I think there's some bigger opportunities. All right, let's go ahead. We're going to go and wrap on up in a second. We'll be getting into our interviews. I do want to take a look at the sectors and see what was hot and what was not. We usually do this a little bit earlier, but let's go ahead. Let's take a look here. Technology, actually, 
Now it's going to still be energy. Energy still leading us up 1.81. So uh, Exxon Mobil having a 6.6% day. Uh, Chevron having a really good day. These were the stocks that were beaten down last week that I was looking to see if we'd get the bounce back. And it looks like we got a nice energy bounce back here. Technology right behind that um, up about 1.62% from the open. Let's take a look at some of the component names like Apple having a good day today, really bouncing back, trying to get into that shadow. It did feel some of this shadow again. Stopping up around the high right now is 137.06. So we'll see if we can get back through that level today. Um, definitely turned around, around 137. That's the level that we'll look for a day two upside move. You can see we're pushing on but up here and really creating a basing closer towards this 130. We'll see if we can get on back on to the downside and see some downside. But for right now, getting a little bit of a bounce there in Apple. Microsoft seeing the same thing, kind of a little bit of a bounce, not a crazy trading action day, but a little bit of a bounce nonetheless. Google here, one to keep on watch, right? A lot of people are watching this one for the stock split that's going to be coming on up. This one could get starting to ramp. I want to see it get past 2300s and then 2400s. And if we can do that, I definitely think you're going to probably start seeing some investors taking some shots on this. You see that bottoming around 22. But the problem here is that it's expensive, right? And so you got to know how to trade a stock like this. It's not easy and the spreads are pretty wide. So that, that can happen here on a stock like this. So just be careful. Make sure that you're understanding the true range is about 80, 80 points here. And so in, in one day, it can easily move that 80 points. Uh, so you got to understand that if you're trying to make an investment decision on a stock like Google. Um, I did see some other stocks mentioned in the chat. Molin. Molin. Yeah, I saw Molin moving a little bit earlier. Um, we could take a look at that. That's up there towards 156. Really needs to continue going. 171 is going to be an important level to watch here. As it gets on through there, it should find some resistance. I didn't see any news. Let me know if there's some news out on Molin right now, but I, I personally didn't catch it this morning. Something that I'm going to keep on watch, and we'll see what happens right now. It definitely looks like it's a growth on bouncing type of day. You can see here, whenever I think, is it a growth day? What do I do? I don't need to struggle too much. I just go to uh, ARKK and start taking a look at how that, those holdings are doing. If it's going like, let's say, 75% in the green, more than likely growth on and risk on type of day. And you can see here Tesla, NVIDIA up 6%. This was one of my best trades given in pre-market on live trading. We were looking for this one to get, give you a nice look. And I was actually trying to get this one right out the gates on the VWAP bounce it's kind of annoyed. I didn't get my fill there right out the gates here on this pullback. It pushed on up there to 165. I tried to get this pullback here, back on down here. Didn't get the fill, and then eventually it just started pushing back. It held VWAP, though, gave me another opportunity, and then continued to drive. NVIDIA having a great day after getting beat down last week. And now we're trying to see if it's going to be able to hold, hold these gains. But even Shop, Shop also getting a lift. A lot of the stocks that were beaten down got that good boom right out the gates like Zoom and then started slowly leaking it back. What you want to see is if it can close at the upper quadrant of the price action. So if we can actually close up high, that's going to be an actual good look for me as we're seeing a lot of these pullbacks come back. And we'll see if we actually get that ramp back up in these names and you can see some closing up there to really show you strength and that it wasn't maybe just a dead cat rally or one of these bull traps that we talked about earlier. All right. Uh, S Y M symbolic. Ah, that's an interesting one. It was holding on the gains here, but really kind of really volatile name here. Let's take a look here. Um, let me take, let me see the ATR here on the daily. Yeah. The ATR is out of this world here right now. Uh, definitely ripping on up here. ATR right now, I have it up at four four points. Four points on a name like this is a little bit hard to deal with. You're going to see some huge volatility in a name like this. The only thing I can tell you that you can maybe get around on a name like Symbolic is maybe using like an hourly chart, deeper time frames to catch those pullbacks and looking for the next rip. But then again, you're talking about a, almost 100% move back up there if it went back through 30s. We'll see what happens on this one. All advice, lower volume, just be careful on a name like this, SYM. We'll see what happens. 
These are the same patterns we saw during the last rally. VWAP bids, low volume. Hey, that happens, Jonathan. If you notice patterns, look to see if maybe they repeat, especially in an environment. Like you said, these have been happening in the latest rallies in a bear market. That's what you've been seeing. See if maybe the pattern continues. All right, that's going to do it for the hots and what was not. Let's go ahead. Let's get into our next interview. We're going to dive on in here with Luke Lloyd, Wealth Advisor and Investment Strategist at Strategy Wealth Partners. He's also uh, customly on Fox Business, but today he'll be on Benzinga, of course. Uh, before we dive on into that, I'm going to go ahead and play a little Benzinga trailer here, and then we'll dive right into our interview. Introducing portfolio synchronization with your brokerage. Now you can securely connect your brokerage account to Benzinga Pro, opening a world of personalization. Screen lightning fast news just for the stocks you own. Set alerts for news catalysts that affect only the companies you care about. It's all possible with a simple click and a secure protective connection. Overcome uncertainty and connect your portfolio to Benzinga Pro today. All right, in a second, I'm going to go ahead and jump on it here with Luke Lloyd. I'll let him check the settings right quick. I just want to make sure he can hear me and he has his audio settings right. Like always, we're going to go ahead and keep working. And one of the things that I've been working on more and more is that we're going to get some some really in-depth graphics coming on through here. I can't wait to give us an, kind of an uplift, but we're really pushing the levels here on stock market movers. So I want to go ahead and dive into our interview here. Luke, you think you're ready here? Thumbs up. Boom. Let's do it. Let's go ahead. Uh, let's bring on Luke Lloyd here, Wealth Advisors, Investment Strategist at Strategies, Wealth Partners, and Fox Business Contributor. If you could do me the favor, just hit the unmute button on StreamYard right there. Can you hear me? Boom. I got you loud and clear. You got me? All right. It wasn't working earlier when I was trying out the settings, so I'm glad you got me. Hey, that's what it's all about. It works. We have you on here. I'm happy to have you on here on Stock Market Movers. I haven't talked to you before, but super interested in finding out a little bit more first about strategies, wealth partners, and what do they do? Yeah, so we're an RIA. We help uh, you know retirees and everybody around the you know spectrum help make money, right? So it comes down to financial planning, tax planning, investment management. Um, everyone's got different goals and objectives. We find out what those goals and objectives are. Um, and then we tailor an investment strategy customized to that strategy, right? So um, we've got five CFAs in house that you know constantly manage the uh, stock strategy. All they do is sit in their office all day doing research and picking the stocks. We barely let them out of the office. They barely see the light of the, light of the day. Um, so that's a little bit of background about what we do here. But you know, here's the, here's the thing, Mitch. You know, just the same as you, man. We're very passionate. We love the market. This is what we live, die, breathe. We like to win, and this is our way of winning. Yeah, and you can't win in one day, right? You got to keep working at it. It's all about consistency, especially in the markets. So love to hear that they're stuck in the cave and you, you keep them in that cave until we get that good research. I can't blame you, Luke. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's continue going. Now, one of the most eye-catching statements that I caught last week on the FOMC meeting, of course, coming from Jerome Powell, is that he sees no slowing down of the economy. And I and he specifically said no, and that's where I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit confused. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I, I don't see these in the numbers. What do you see out there? Well, this is the big disconnect that we're seeing between the academics and people running stuff, the Federal Reserve and the federal government, both are culprits of it, to where they're, they're looking at all this ridiculous theoretical research um, and looking at these numbers, but they refuse to actually go down to Main Street and just walk into a grocery store, go up, go fill up their own gas pump. I mean, these people are so disconnected from reality. I mean, it's honestly, it, it's laughable, but it's not laughable either because in this environment, this is not the time to laugh. People are hurting very badly with the inflation numbers, the consumers continuing to uh, not be as strong. I think consumer confidence is down to the lowest levels we've ever seen throughout history. People are saving 0% of their money. I mean, back during COVID, that number was 10 to 20% of people's income. That number is now down to 0%. So here's the thing, Mitch. You know, it, it all comes back down to where our economy is headed, 
both from the consumer and business side. The backbone of the economy from the consumer side is middle class America and middle class America can barely afford to live. Again, these politicians, Federal Reserve just need to get in their car, go to a gas station, go to a grocery store. You'll see people start to search for you know, uh, price searching now. People didn't do that a couple of years ago. And then the backbone of the economy from the business side is small business. And if you take a look at small cap stocks, they're seeing costs of doing business rise by almost 16 percent. And that's small cap stocks. That's not even small business. Small business is probably seeing upwards of 20 percent. And they can't even find employees right now because the large corporations are poaching all the employees. So, you know, again, small business, the costs are rising extreme. So what, what do they start looking at? They start looking at their costs. And unfortunately, employees, especially for small business owners, are a big part of that cost. So a lot of you know, people are going to start to get laid off. And that's not accounted for right now in the economy or the stock market. It, it, again, we're looking at numbers right now. We're not looking at numbers, how they're going to be six months down the road. And that's what's important for the stock market. Yeah, look at it. Um, uh, it's, it's maybe not in the small cap game, but uh, I, I'm big on uh, the, the Dutch coffees, the Dutch bros. And uh, one of the things clearly stated in their earnings report were where their margins were going, right? A yep. lot of that were, yeah. I mean, we, we got to afford plastic. We got to afford plastic cut some lids and the, well, all the that's, prices that's are going up, right? Example. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 one of the most interesting things I saw actually today is that earnings growth is lower right now than sales growth. It never used to be that way. <laughs> and, and that's interesting because that means that sales are going up percentage wise, but earnings margins are getting completely compressed. And this kind of goes back I mean, there's all kinds of different factors. There's wages, there's travel costs, you know, input costs to making the products and then transporting them across the sea. And one thing that's not talked about very often is how important oil and gas is. You know, everyone talks about gas being through the roof of the gas pump and oil being up to, you know, $110, $120 a barrel. But what people don't actually realize is that almost like 85%, I believe that's the number of products have some sort of oil-based product in them, right? So everything is based around oil. Transporting oil, you know, across the ocean from China to the U.S. or from somewhere else, you know, around the world to the U.S. That takes diesel, and diesel runs the world. Diesel world runs businesses, and, and that's what's being reflected a lot in these margins. And a lot of businesses are hurting. That's why it's important to find you know, uh, businesses to where the margins aren't getting compressed, they have strong cash flow and they have low debt because right now you see interest rates rising. You don't want to have very high debt because you don't want to refinance that debt at, you know, five, six, seven percent. Now, when you could have refinanced it, financed it a couple of years ago, what, at two percent or three percent? Yeah, we're, I think everyone's thinking about that right now. Um, you just mentioned some oil talk, so let's get into that. I'll skip a little bit forward, and I'll come back to some other questions. Oil catching a little bit of a bounce today, and you know, talks of Biden doing a gas holiday. Of course, a lot of talks about production on out there. So the hard question, right? I mean, is oil on more of a correction recently, or is this a pullback that we all should have on our radar? Well, that's a great question, Mitch. Um, you know, I, I think oil is is a good trade at this point. I wouldn't say it's an investment. Um, if you take a look back at previous recessions, like 08, 09, I think oil was up to like $140, $150 a barrel back then, right? Um, right after the recession happened, because of the small demand, the low demand in the economy, because people weren't traveling as much, because they were having a hard time just basically living their life at their home, oil crashed from like $140 a barrel down to like $50 or $60 a barrel. And I wouldn't be surprised if that happens maybe here in the next couple of years, you know, once maybe Russia-Ukraine situation gets figured out, we do enter a recession and people are just trying to save money again, rather than take their vacations, travel all, all around the world like they were a couple of years ago. You know, I think we'll, we might see something similar like that, similar like that happen. But in the meantime, you know, while oil is still sitting at $110 a barrel and there's just huge demand still, people still are going out and spending their money, even though inflation is high. The, you know, there's no supply out there because of the Russia Ukraine situation. And we refuse to turn on the pipeline here in America. You know, we could have had oil pumping here, I think, in a couple months if we would have kept the pipeline going. Uh, you know, we shut that down a couple months ago. You know, you know, you know, once, once Biden, Biden came in the, into the administration, right? So, you know, there's no supply out there, there's still strong demand. Um, I don't see that getting fixed anytime soon. And right now, oil companies are making a lot of money, right? So they're going to continue to try to pump that oil. But again, there's no supply. So I think prices may be a good trade um, upwards for oil, but not in the long term. Stay away in the long term. 
Definitely something to watch is also the development and you're talking about it in the oil. There could be demand destruction starting to happen from that oil, but it also leads to issues that we could see showing its face in EV, right? Uh, U.S. is like many around the world that are trying to push further and further into EVs, especially from our legacy automakers like, you know, Ford and GM. Uh, but the truth is, is that many auto manufacturers are right now struggling, right, with material costs and the cost around to just even make these vehicles. So is this a sign of concern moving forward? It absolutely is. I mean, specifically for EV makers, auto manufacturers in general. Um, you know, the thing is, you know, during the recession, which again, as you, if you couldn't tell already, I haven't really talked about it on here. I think we're most likely entering a recession, if not already in a recession um, right now. So you know, when we're doing that, people stop buying cars. You know, they run their cars into the ground for, you know, 10 years plus. You know, all of the automakers are going to be struggling, I think, over the next couple of years to turn a profit. So, you know, Ford announced a couple of days ago that, you know, the cost of building cars has significantly gone up, those input prices, right? Those costs completely wiped out the profitability of the new Ford Mach-E, you know, Mustang, their EV. Um, so again, when the economy enters a recession, the last place you want to be are these cyclical names. People don't buy cars. And, and this goes back to kind of what we saw over the past decade. I mean, EV stocks, crypto, um, SPACs, they're all the epitome of the massive liquidity bubble that we've been in over the past decade. When companies like Lucid and Rivian, who make zero cars, had a market cap of $100 billion, you know there's a speculation liquidity bubble, right? So when people have money, they speculate and take on a lot of risk. After trillions of dollars from the Fed and trillions from the federal government, people were flooded with money. Now, when people are out of money, you know, they're you know, saving again 0%, they don't take on risk and in investments, and they slow down their spending habits, right? So EVs, auto manufacturers, not a place I think you want to be. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you just mentioned that liquidity bubble. You know, I went through it uh, completely. I actually ran a show on SPACs for a good while there. And it seemed like, you know, it was an easy 40 to 50 percent gainer. And I mean, sometimes you don't say that in a lifetime. So uh, there's definitely that liquidity bubble that showed up. But it wasn't only in SPACs. We saw that in, in some of the crypto markets. We saw that also in, I would say, these IPOs also, because I mean, I mean, we could pull up the chart of coin, but I don't think anybody wants to look at that uh, or hood. And some of these companies that came out that, you know, just had huge outlooks for growth, but had been getting destroyed here. And yeah. uh, I mean, this happened also in the dot com era. So uh, what are you seeing in the liquidity bubble? And is it are any of these names looking like they're coming back or it's just kind of issues now with their valuations and what they came out of? Well, when you have this huge liquidity bubble like we've had over the past really decades since the financial crisis in 08, 09, um, we've kind of, we're in press, unprecedented times. We, we haven't hiked rates this quickly and offloaded the balance sheet from the Fed this much to combat inflation ever, right? So when that happens, there's a couple of things you want to keep in mind. Valuations, you know, past couple of years, you could basically throw money at the wall and make money somewhere, right? That's what happens when there's so much liquidity out there. People are speculative. They take on risk. They'll buy anything. Now, as we're entering the complete opposite environment, and hopefully, you know, the Federal Reserve and the federal government don't take their foot off the pedal. Hopefully, they continue to do what they're doing because this is much needed. If we keep on, if we come back in with stimulus, we come back in with buying assets on the balance sheet again, it's just going to make the bubble bigger in the long term. And, you know, there's investors who have a 20, 30 year time frame are going to, get, going to get hit even worse. I'd rather let the bubble kind of burst right now. So the thing you want to look for right now when the bubble is bursting is cash flow and keep valuations in mind. I think the S&P is trading at like 16 to 17 times earnings, depending on the day right now. You know, historically, as we enter bear markets and recessions, that can get downwards of 14 times earnings. Um, that puts the S&P kind of closer down to the 3,000 level. I'm not saying that we're going to get down to the 3,000 level. I'm saying that's a possibility. And if you use history, that's kind of where we're going. So you want to look for the strong cash flow companies, companies that aren't overvalued, that are you know, kind of value oriented. And that's why you know, technology, it's, it's, it's a great space because the last thing uh, people get rid of as they're trying to make their business more efficient and optimize their business is their technology. It makes technology makes business more efficient. It makes it more profitable as they're getting rid of some of their employees. So we're taking a look at stocks like Intuit. You know, everyone knows their tax software. 
you know, TurboTax, along with their business facing platform, QuickBooks, again, with the economy most likely heading into a recession, business productivity and efficiency is the most important thing. Companies get rid of employees. They don't get rid of their technology. I don't know if you saw the last um, the latest credit card debt readings, but credit card debt is skyrocketing and going through the roof. So Intuit just acquired Credit Karma. So a lot of you know people are going to be utilizing Credit Karma services to check their credit cards, get new loans, get new get uh, get new credit cards, um, do balance transfers. So these are kind of stocks that you want to take a look at that actually will hold up in a recessionary environment. Could it drop five or ten percent? It could, right? But it's going to hold up a lot better than a lot of these high beta names, these high growth names, where you don't want to be. You know, the, the biggest thing is um, a lot of people are going to get in trouble uh, buying stocks that are down eighty to ninety percent. They, they're going to say there's a lot of value there. Um, it's down eighty percent from the highs, but you can't do that in this kind of market. Those stocks are going to continue to most likely get hammered, in my opinion. There's going to be a few diamonds in the rough, but you really want to get um, up the cap spectrum and you want to go up quality, flight to quality. Well, thank you, like always, for uh, joining in here. And I, I got to say, I appreciated the conversation. And we definitely got to do some more deep dives. I'll look forward to having you back, Luke Lloyd. If you guys want to go ahead and find him on Twitter, because that's what we do on our show. We definitely follow the guests that come on here. Twitter. Because I'm on there that, every day. You know, I'm engaging with you. And I love That's Twitter. what it's about. I, I mean, that's where a lot of times, yeah, I know a lot of people talk bad about Twitters, but the, one of the best things that I think that happens there is that you get to see overall sentiment in real action, in real time. And I think that's important too, to definitely keep up on. So check him out, guys. I put it in the description below. If you guys want to go ahead and give him a follow. Thank you for joining me, Thanks, uh, Luke, today. And we'll definitely have you on. Uh, Wealth Thanks, Advisor, man. Investment Strategist at Strategies Wealth Partners. And look for him to come on more often and hit up that Twitter. Let him know how great of a job he did today. So we'll have you back, Luke. Thank you. Thanks, bro. All right, guys, it's going to go ahead and wrap on up here on Stock Market Movers, where we go ahead and get to the expert that give you guys the informational edge that you guys need to continue watching the markets. Like always, guys, this is just for informational purposes only, not for investment advice. And we're going to continue to watch here and bring on the experts that you guys need to continue pushing forward. So if you guys appreciated getting not only to the headlines, but also the experts, hit the thumbs on up down below. Hit the subscribe bell, and now it's time for none other than the roadmap. We're going to get you over to the roadmap. That's our NFT show. Um, of course, it's an important week with NYC NFT going on. A lot going on, 8 Fest. There's so much to talk about. I'll let Chris do the talking there, and you guys go get the catch with Chris Ketchy. I'll see you guys next time right here on Stock Market Movers as we continue to get to the headlines and the experts that you guys need. See you next time. Smash the like before we get on out of here as we keep on going.